Guilt is burning, inside I'm hurting. This ain't a feeling I can keep, so blame it on the night. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the session to order, so if you're uh, coming in, please come up and come toward the front. Feel free to, you know, get cozy. Um, welcome to our series of award sessions this morning. I hope that you will be able to stay for all of them because I think we've got a great lineup um, set up for you. Our first award is the Richtmeyer Memorial Lecture Award. Floyd Rickmeyer served as the fourth president of the American Association of Physics Teachers beginning in 1937. Rickmeyer's life displayed his interest in both the contributions and their communication through his service as president of the, US, of the AAPT, as well as the president of the Optical Society and as president of the American Physical Society. As a teacher, author, research worker, and dean, he was the guide for many young physicists who became leaders of American science and has had a wide influence on the development of physics within the United States. The Rickmeyer Memorial Lecture Award has been given since 1941 to a person who has made outstanding contributions to physics and effectively communicated those contributions to physics educators. Mark Beck is Benjamin H. Brown Professor of Physics and Chair of the Department of Physics at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. He earned his BS and PhD in optics at the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester. His first position at Reed College and now at Whitman were selected in part because of his attraction to teaching and conducting research with undergraduate students. After Mark and his undergraduate researchers built the right apparatus, they were able to test quantum mechanical predictions in the laboratory. These tests provided support for the quantum nature of the physical world and for quantum entanglement. The ability for undergraduates to conduct such experiments and see quantum effects for themselves was revolutionary. Multiple influential publications has allowed such experiments to be carried out at other institutions. As a colleague at Whitman College remarked, Beck's single greatest accomplishment is a reformulation of the teaching of undergraduate quantum mechanics. His intellect and vision allowed him to develop, to develop instrumentation, curricular materials, and an accompanying text, all of which have been popularly received and are becoming widely used. He is a talented physicist and consummate teacher. Mark has also been recognized at Whitman College as a master teacher, receiving two teaching awards there. He's been involved with the Northwest chapter of the American Physical Society and is a member of the APS Division of Laser Sciences Distinguished Traveling Lecturer Committee. For these reasons, AAPT is pleased to present the 2018 Richtmeyer Memorial Lecture Award to Dr. Mark Beck. Thank you. I won't do that. Smile for the camera. Great. All right, um, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm pleased to uh, be able to talk to you today. And uh, like any significant honors, um, there are a lot of people that I need to thank. Uh, I'm not gonna put a whole big list of individual names here. There'd be too many. Um, just wanna say thank you to a whole bunch of people, family, teachers, et cetera. Uh, the list is here. Um, I wouldn't be here without these people. So thanks all very much to all of you. Um, I wanna, here's the title of my talk and I wanna suggest that there are two different ways to read this title. The first emphasizes this notion of quantum 2.0, right? And here's, a, here's a, an article where I sort of first saw that term. It's, uh, it's an article that was written by the Defense uh, Science and Technology Laboratory in the UK. Uh, and before we wanna talk about quantum 2.0, we should talk about quantum 1.0. And quantum 1.0 is basically the quantum mechanics we're all really familiar with, quantum mechanics of Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Dirac, et cetera. Um, and there's a number of different sort of technologies that have come out of that uh, thinking of quantum mechanics. They're listed here. Um, and then, but quantum 2.0 is based on sort of the more subtle, less familiar aspects of quantum mechanics, and it has the potential to create the second quantum revolution. So 
where does that come from? Uh, so here's an article uh, that, where I first saw that term, the second quantum revolution. It's a 2003 article uh, by Jonathan Dowling and Gerard Milborn. It's a really interesting article. Uh, there's a couple of quotes here from this article. The bottom line is the way to think about this is, in the way that I think about it, is sort of quantum 1.0 gave us the rules, and quantum 2.0 is going to take these rules and going to allow us to develop sort of new technologies. So uh, quantum 1.0 is all about understanding and explaining the world around us. Here are a number of different uh, things that we are now able to explain. It's extremely successful theory uh, to be able to explain all of uh, this sort of physics here. Uh, and it has led to these sorts of technologies, taken us into the information age, really have a profound impact on our lives. But like I said, we could, using this original interpretation, we can kind of explain the world around us. So for example, we can solve the Schrodinger equation and we can predict electronic structure of atoms and de define, right, and understand the spectra that's emitted by those atoms. But then we're pretty much limited by the atoms that nature gives us, right? You want a particular spectral line, you look it up, you find the, the right atom or, or material and then you use that spectral line. Nowadays, the technology is getting to the point where we're not limited just by what nature gives us. We can engineer our own sort of atoms that have the properties that we want. So uh, for example, uh, these are cadmium selenide quantum dots. Uh, they're just nanoscopic particles of material. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you can see here that the smallest size here is two nanometers. You know, that's not quite an atom, but we're talking about atomic scale here. So we're able to sort of engineer materials on the scale of, you know, a couple of atoms. And by doing that using quantum size effects, we can take this and make it emit light at any wavelength that we want pretty much, okay? And it's, it's this ability to engineer that I think this is really kind of leading us on. So for example, why is this useful? Well, it's all the same material. And so it's all the same manufacturing process and, and it allows it then to be integrated into technology much more easily than having to deal with a whole bunch of different stuff, right? So quantum dots of different sizes can be used to make uh, high definition displays. Another thing that uh, quantum 2.0 is gonna influence is um, cryptography, the way that we communicate with each other uh, over uh, electronic means. So for example, Alice wants to send a message to Bob, but she's really worried about Eve, who might listen in on uh, their conversation, and she really wants to send this message in secret. So maybe uh, Alice wants to buy something on the internet, and she wants to send her credit card information to Bob, and she doesn't want Eve to have any of that information. So what does she do? Well, one uh, technique for this is kind of standard in cryptography is Eve has a key. And the key here is just a random string of bits, just random numbers. And Bob also has to have a copy of this key. Eve uses that key to encrypt her information. And this uh, process here, if, if the key is random and the encryption process basically reads to just another random string of bits. And there's no information about the original message absent the key. She sends that uh, encrypted message over to Bob. Bob uses his copy of the key to decrypt the message. But if Eva sits here in the middle and she intercepts the message, she doesn't get any information. She just gets garbage unless she has a copy of the key. So what's the hard part here? Well, the hard part is getting a copy of the key to Bob, right? So Alice and Bob have to have a copy of the same key. It's gotta be a random string of bits. And they wanna make sure that Eve doesn't have any information about that key. And this is the problem that quantum mechanics solves. In quantum key distribution, Alice and Bob can share a random key and be certain that Eve doesn't have enough information to decrypt their message. And that certainty is based on the laws of physics. So how might you imagine this would work, right? What might Eve want to do? Well, 
If Eve had some kind of magic copy machine and Alice was sending her key to Bob, if Eve could intercept it and make a copy and then send the original on to Bob, then uh, she would have a key. But quantum mechanics tells us that this, this machine is not possible. You can't build this machine. So the no cloning theorem in quantum mechanics tells us that it is impossible to make a perfect copy of an arbitrary quantum system. And so if Bob has a copy, Eve can't have a copy. Nobody else can have a copy. And so this is how Alice and Bob can be uh, secure in their communications. And this technology exists. It's off the shelf. You can buy it uh, right now. Quantum key distribution. Uh, banks are using this technology now to do financial transactions in large uh, financial centers, New York, London, etc., to make sure that uh, their, uh, their messages are secure. That exists. Where are we going next? Quantum computing, right? So a classical computer. Well, a classical register in a, in a classical computer can be either a zero or a one. But in quantum mechanics, a quantum bit, or better known as a qubit, can be in a superposition of zero and one at the same time. And if you then perform an operation on a qubit that's been initialized uh, in this way, you simultaneously perform the operation on both possibilities. And that leads to what's known as quantum parallelism. And this is some, where you get some of the speed up in uh, quantum mechanical algorithms. But quantum computers also require entanglement. Um, and I would say, from my perspective, entanglement is the distinguishing feature of quantum mechanics. It's the thing that really sets quantum mechanics apart from classical mechanics. It's a, it's a form of correlation that is stronger than is allowed by any laws of classical physics, okay? But it's experimentally difficult. We can entangle small numbers of qubits, but entangling large numbers of qubits is, is experimentally difficult. Uh, it's getting easier all the time. But if we, can, if we can do this, if we can entangle 1,000 or 2,000 qubits, we can solve problems, in particular sort of mathematical problems, that cannot be solved effectively on a classical computer. So, problems that would literally take the age of the universe to run the program on a classical computer could be done in a finite time on a quantum mechanical computer. So that's kind of the speed up that we're talking about for certain kinds of problems. Things become possible. Now there are a lot of different uh, research groups working on this technology, a lot of um, uh, companies that are working on this technology. I'm just gonna highlight one here. Uh, this is IBM, this is their quantum computer, uh, you can see basically this is just a very large cryostat. Um, here's what's inside. Uh, the processor itself is just down here at the bottom. It's held at 20 millikelvin. Uh, it's uh, got 50 superconducting qubits. Uh, the rest of this is basically just electronic feed-throughs to get the signals in and out. I think this thing is actually really pretty. Kind of reminds me of a jellyfish, right? Um, but 50 superconducting qubits, that's, we're getting there now, right? This was just announced a month or so ago, um, and we're starting to get to the pro, uh, point where with 50 qubits, you can do some real interesting things that we couldn't uh, simulate before. And it's in the cloud. You can use it. Well, not the 50 qubit. It's not quite online yet. That's, that's sort of uh, behind the scenes. But a couple of weeks ago, I logged on to the IBM site, uh, and I ran a, a program on a, on a quantum computer. So this was just the five qubit computer that they had. If you look here, these sort of horizontal lines at the bottom each represent uh, a single qubit. I'm actually only doing the simplest thing possible. I'm just looking at two of these qubits. And if you look down here, so here's my program, the blue boxes correspond to operations that you would perform on those uh, qubits and the pink boxes correspond to measurements performed. And like all quantum measurements, they're probabilistic. So quantum algorithms, you run them many times and you look at statistics that come out, and the outcomes here are given by the histogram. 
And for this really simple program, I would have expected 50% uh, here and 50% here. And you probably can't read that, but what it is is there was about 51% here and about 39% here. The other 10% is down here in the middle where I would have not expected to see anything. And so the coherence times aren't quite there. There's a little, um, it's not perfect. Uh, but with a 50 qubit computer, you can start actually imagining doing error corrections on this, and then these errors would, would go away. And it's coming along. If you had told me, you know, three years ago that IBM would have a 50 qubit computer today, I would not have believed it. So this is advancing much more rapidly than I would have expected um, even just a couple of years ago. And we're really starting to blur the lines between quantum physics and quantum engineering. Your physics students, undergraduate physics students, can now go to graduate programs in quantum engineering. They can go off into industry with a, with a bachelor's degree in physics and get a job title of quantum engineer. Okay? Here's a list of companies in, uh, that are working on what I would consider sort of quantum 2.0 technologies. This is just out of Wikipedia. Uh, the very top of the list is here. Uh, there's 42 companies on this list. I know of several others that are working on it that aren't on the list. It's clearly not complete, right? And these companies really believe that these sort of quantum 2.0 technologies are really going to move us forward, right? And, and I haven't even talked about things like metrology, uh, precision measurements that, that's being enabled, right? There's all kinds of different things that, that's going to, um, I think, really have a major impact on, on technology and the way we live our lives. And it's not just about applications and engineering. I think it's going to filter back and maybe help us answer some really fundamental questions, right? So here's some questions I would like the answers to, right? And here's a book that derives quantum mechanics from information theory. So you start with some information theoretic postulates, apply the laws of, of information theory, and you can derive all of quantum mechanics. And this suggests a really strong link between quantum mechanics and information theory. And can thinking about quantum mechanics in that way, in the light of information theory, can it help us to answer these sorts of questions? I don't know the answer to that, but it's not going to hurt. All right. So I said that there were two different ways to sort of read the title of my talk. And now I want to talk about uh, the other one. And especially in a conference of physics educators, uh, I want to now put the emphasis on preparing our students. So in this new world, can we think about how we want to teach quantum mechanics? And I'm talking here specifically about, right now, junior, senior, undergraduate quantum mechanics class. And here's one way I might suggest that we would do this. Rather than beginning with wave mechanics, let's start with matrix mechanics. Why? Well, one reason is, is with matrix mechanics, we can start talking about two-dimensional systems, the absolute simplest quantum systems that you can imagine. Two dimensions, Just, right? And so, for examples here are photon polarization, horizontal and vertical polarizations uh, form the two states. Spin one half, spin up spin down, two state systems. You start with two dimensional vectors. You have two by two matrices which represent the operators that operate on those systems. And then, so after you've started really simple, then you build to the more complicated systems. Higher order spin, larger, uh, larger dimensional discrete systems. And then you move on to sort of continuous variable systems, position, momentum, et cetera, et cetera. It's nice because it's conceptually simple. Again, it's the simplest quantum system you could possibly imagine. It places a lot of emphasis on these two state systems, right? Qubits are interesting. Um, and at first, if you haven't taught quantum mechanics this way, you might think, okay, two state system, we'll do that for two or three weeks and then we'll kind of move on. There's not much we can do with that. 
But I would suggest to you if, you, if you immerse yourself in this, there's a huge richness to these two-state systems uh, that, that you can uh, bring to your students. And there's this nice close connection to sort of ideas of entanglement and quantum information. All this information is encoded in qubits. Two-state systems are a good way to talk about that. And then we can move on to higher dimensions. And you don't have to invent the wheel here if you, if you want to teach this way. Here are, or at, there are at least, here are at least four different textbooks I know for uh, undergraduate students that present quantum mechanics in this way. Uh, and right, here's one, right, I'm not making this up from the beginning, right, John Townsend, uh, that book has been around for 25 years. So people have been teaching this way for a while. Um, and so now let me just tell you a little bit about my course, right, my one semester quantum mechanics course, what I go through and kind of how it's presented in uh, my text. I actually start with classical polarization. Classical polarization of an electromagnetic wave, any arbitrary uh, polarization can be described as a linear combination of horizontal and vertical polarizations. You can express any polarization as a two-dimensional complex vector, any operation you may want to do on that, so a wave plate that rotates that polarization or a polarizer can be described by a two-by-two two matrix. And, and it's a good way, it's a, it's a nice application of linear algebra to a physical system that students are kind of familiar with and can really grasp. Okay? And you don't spend a lot of time here, two lectures, less than a week, just to kind of get them to think in, in terms of this sort of linear algebra uh, way. And then we move on to the quantum mechanics of polarization, and we talk about polarization of individual photons, introduce... Uh, Dirac notation and talk about bras and kets, uh, how you represent those operators, and if you then express those in terms of column vectors and two by two operators, they're identical. The quantum operators are exactly the same as the classical operators. Okay? And so this sort of eases the transition, this notion of you know, quantum mechanics being this kind of spooky a hard kind of thing, it, it, when you make the parallel to the actual classical physics of the same problem, it, it's not so hard. And so it, it kind of eases that transition from the, for the students. A nice thing I like about polarization is because, right, horizontal and vertical are orthogonal to each other in real physical space and in Hilbert space. But students need to learn that that's not all systems, not all quantum systems are that simple. Uh, so we then move on and talk about spin one half, where again, that sort of the vectors and the matrices all look the same. It's a two-dimensional system. The quantum mechanics is, is very, very uh, similar in Hilbert space. But in real space, up is orthogonal to down, right? When students first see that, they're going to struggle. Because for years, we've been telling them, no, those things aren't orthogonal. And they're not orthogonal in real space, but they are orthogonal in Hilbert space. And so students need to learn the, the, the difference. But if they've already got sort of the, 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 the background of the mathematics and the notation, it's a little bit easier for them to pick that up. And then we talk about higher dimensional spin systems, and then we can talk about uh, two, two particle systems, so two photons, two electrons, the correlations you can get between them, entanglement, tests of local realism, all that kind of stuff. You can talk about the time evolution of two-state systems, so you're doing the Schrodinger equation, time evolution, but still with just two-state systems. And then you move on, and because that's not all of quantum mechanics, you have to talk about position, momentum, continuous variable systems, solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation, do all the classic problems. Those are really important. So uh, we do those as well. And at the very end of my uh, one semester course, I always save one week to talk about just fun stuff, okay? Quantum teleportation, quantum computing, where I think that the field is going and where the, where the potential exists for, for the students to really kind of pick up and do some interesting things. So I think that's important to talk about at the end. And another uh, nice thing about using optics and two-state systems is you can do the experiments. Okay? You can do f experiments that really look at fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics in an undergraduate teaching laboratory. 
And so uh, these are uh, five experiments that we do uh, at Whitman. I've uh, been doing them for about a dozen years. These are uh, described as appendices in my, in my text. And once you've got the equipment to do these experiments, there's a whole host of other experiments that you can do as well. Okay, so it's really open-ended, lots of opportunities, not just for in this teaching lab, but once you've got the equipment, students working on individu individual projects, theses, whatever, lots of, lots of opportunities to do some uh, really fundamental, interesting stuff. So I want to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about this one particular experiment, the tests of local realism. And I want to do that because um, I think it's the one that makes this closest connection to this sort of notion of quantum 2.0. And it's the one that involves entanglement. Uh, and like I said, that's to me the distinguishing feature of quantum mechanics. So that's why I want to describe this one uh, to you today. And in uh, our laboratory, uh, our, my students actually do two different tests of local realism. And local realism tests are also known as Bell inequality tests. So you might kind of be more familiar with that terminology. So we're testing Bell inequalities um, and comparing quantum physics to classical physics. Um, one test that we do is, is kind of the more standard. It's called the CHSH test. This is you know, the gold standard. This is the, the workhorse of the quantum optics community. Uh, we also do a test that's uh, originally due to Lucien Hardy, um, and it's easy to flip back and forth between these two things. The alignment's the same, the experiment's the same, change a few settings and you test either one, so you may as well do both. Um, and I like the Hardy test because it's a little bit easier to explain to the students. Uh, it's a little bit more intuitive, um, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sort of explain kind of the physics of what's going on in this Hardy test. And um, I'm going to do it in terms of sort of a Gedanken experiment. And at the end, I'll talk about the real experiment and how the analogy goes between the, the actual experiment we do and this sort of Gedanken experiment. So we have to start with Alice. Alice is a first year physics major, has to take Physics 101. But she's bright and motivated and really wants to take Physics 999, theory of everything. But Alice has a problem in that both of these classes meet at the same time. She can't go to both of them. Um, so what she does is dutifully every day she goes to Physics 101, but Physics 999 happens to meet right next door and occasionally her curiosity gets the better of her and she dunks into 999 instead. Actually about half the time Alice goes into 999 instead of Physics 101. Now, Bob is over on the other side of campus, first year psych major, has to take intro psychology, uh, psych 101. Bob is also bright and motivated and really wants to take psych 999, theory of everyone. <laughs> Bob has the same problem that Alice has. Two classes meet at the same time, but they also happen to meet in uh, rooms right next to each other. Goes to class every day, goes to 101 but about half the time goes into 999. Now, Alice notices that the physics faculty have some strange wardrobe preferences. When she's in 101, the faculty member always wears red or blue, never wears any other color. And when she's in 999, the faculty member is always wearing either green or yellow, never wears anything else. And Bob notices that the psych faculty have the same strange wardrobe preferences. Red or blue in 101, green or yellow in 999. Okay, so here's a sort of a summary of, of what's going on. So one day, Alice and Bob are sitting down over lunch and they think this is kind of weird. Um, and so they decide to do an experiment. Every day they're gonna write down which class did I go to and what color was the faculty member wearing. And at the end of the semester, they're going to compare their data, and they're going to see, can I learn something about the psychology of the physics and psychology faculty? So here's their data. And I'm going to assume one thing uh, here. We're going to assume that Alice and Bob actually have a lot more data so that they can get good statistics. So any of the inferences, any of the conclusions that we draw here are, are not just due to statistical flukes, that, that they're statistically valid. 
So Alice and Bob have to kind of analyze this data. And so where are they going to start? Well, they're going to start with those days when they both go to 101, OK? And what do they notice about these days? Well, sometimes they see that both the faculties are wearing red. Not surprising, but it turns out to be uh, important. And so we're going to start now. We're going to make some rules that describe our data. And so rule number one is that it's OK for Alice and Bob both to see red, and that indeed 9% of the time they would see that both faculty members are wearing red. Now Alice and Bob look at the data when they go to opposite classrooms. Alice in 101, Bob in 999, or vice versa. And what do they notice here? Well, it turns out if the person in 101 sees red, the person in 999 always sees green, 100% of the time. So we get two more rules out of this. If Alice is in 101 and she sees red, Bob goes to 999, he has to see green. Or another way to say that is the probability that Alice sees red and Bob sees yellow is zero. And then we have another rule when they we're in the opposite classrooms. So what's one feature of the data that we notice here? It's, it's clearly not perfectly random. What looks to Alice by herself just purely random, she can't see any rhyme or reason to her data. Bob can't see any, anything in his data. It all looks random to him. But when they put them together, they see that they're correlated. There are correlations between what's going on in, in, in physics and psychology, right? If the probability of red is not zero and the probability of yellow is not zero, the joint can't, probability can't be zero unless there are correlations, OK? So things are correlated. So what have we done so far? We've, we've talked about when uh, Alice and Bob both go to uh, 101, and we've talked about what happens when they're in opposite classrooms, but we haven't said anything yet about what happens when they go to, uh, um, they're both in 999. And let's see if we can use these three rules to infer some feature of the data that we would expect to see for when they're both in 999. So we'll start here. We're, we'll think about these days, right? And so for the moment, I'm only interested in the days, these 9% of the days when they would both go to 101 and would both see red, red. What happens if Bob changes his mind and goes to 999 instead? Well, rule two says that he has to see green. Because this is a day Alice is going to be in 101. She's going to see red. Bob has to see green if he goes into 999. What if instead Alice changes her mind? Well, by rule number three, she has to see green. OK. Well, what if they both change their minds? They both have to see green, right? So rules two and three basically tell us that every time they would have seen red, red, if they change their minds, they have to see green, green. And what this says then is that the probability that they see green, green is at least as likely as the probability that they would have seen red, red, and that's 9% of the time, OK? So this is our inference. We infer from the, the data that we have and from our rules that Alice and Bob should measure green green at least 9% of the time. And notice that this is an inequality. This is a form of a Bell inequality. And this is what we want to test experimentally. And so now we have to look at the rest of the data. What happens when they both go to 999? They never see green green. They look at their data and that probability is zero. How do we explain this? Right? So first you might say, well, there's, there's some flaw in that inference, right? Uh, you know, I've inferred this, and there's got to be some flaw in that logic. And I will assure you that, it's, uh, that there's no flaw in that logic. You can rigorously prove this result mathematically. I'm not going to do it now, but, but there's no sort of flaw in that logic. So what else might it be? Well, have we made any assumptions? So clearly, if you make assumptions, and then you base an inference upon those assumptions, if the assumptions get violated, the whole house of cards falls down. So let's think about what assumptions uh, Alice and Bob are, are making about their data. Well, first of all, Alice and Bob are assuming locality. 
And in this scenario, what that means is they're assuming that the faculty don't communicate with each other, right? So there's two types of communication. First one is perfectly legitimate. So the faculty members wake up in the morning, they drink their coffee, they call each other up on the phone, and they say, I'm going to wear green. Why don't you wear blue? I think it's a nice day. You look good in blue today. It might be creepy, but there's nothing wrong with that, right? So we said that there's correlations between, the, between their wardrobes. This is where those correlations get established when they wake up in the morning and coordinate. But then we'll assume that they don't communicate again after that. And specifically, we're assuming that if Alice walks into the classroom, the physics faculty member doesn't pull out a cell phone out of their pockets, call over to psychology and say, hey, uh, Alice walked in my classroom, I'm wearing blue, you better change your shirt. Because if they can do that, they can create any statistics that they could ever imagine, right? So Alice and Bob are assuming that the faculty aren't doing that, okay? And more generally, what we're assuming is, you know, in classical physics, we assume locality. And what we mean sort of generally is that measurements over here don't affect measurements over here. They could still be correlated if they're measuring correlated from a correlated source, but the measurement act itself doesn't create some spooky action at a distance someplace else. So locality is built into classical physics. We're also assuming reality. And that is that objects have real, objective, measurable properties, whether or not you actually measure them. So right, we said that Alice walks into this room and she sees red, but if she had gone into that room, she would have seen green. But we actually only made one of those measurements. On any given day, Alice can go into 101 or 99, she can't do both. And we're assuming that it's green over there. Maybe that's not true. Nobody actually looked to see that it was green. Maybe redness or greenness isn't, doesn't exist absent a measurement of that. And that's what we mean by reality, right? And, rea and again, this is built into to classical uh, physics, right? We assume that objects have properties, mass, charge, whatever, whether or not we measure them. And maybe that's not the way the world works. So where are we at? Um, we, we came up with an inference. We had derived this sort of this inequality. Uh, we tested it experimentally. We found that we violated that inequality. And we conclude then that uh, the assumptions had to have been violated. And we are assuming locality and reality. And so what we say then is that this experiment violates local realism. The world is not both real and local at the same time if, and in order to explain the data. If we do an experiment that violates this, the conclusion has to be that we have to give up one, at least one of these things, maybe both of them, okay? And like I said, that's, they're built into classical mechanics, but they're not built into quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics violates local realism. Quantum systems can violate this inequality, okay? And so uh, let me describe now um, how we actually do this. So in the lab, what do we have? We start out with a, a nonlinear crystal. It's just a piece of transparent material. And we shine a, a laser beam on here. Uh, and with very small but non-zero probability, uh, randomly, one of these photons in this uh, blue laser beam will get converted into two other photons. And like all processes in physics, this conserves energy. So the energies of the outgoing photons have to add up to the incoming energy. If I express that in terms of Planck's relationship, you see I get this. If I cross off the H's, you see that the frequencies of the outgoing photons have to add up to the incoming frequency. Nominally, they're at about half of the incoming frequency, which puts them at about twice the wavelength. So we start out with uh, 400 nanometer blue light, and we produce uh, individual photons or photon pairs at about 800 nanometers in the near infrared. This process has to conserve momentum. So if I put a detector here, I know exactly what angle the other photon has to come out, so I know where to put my detector to, to see the right pair. And the photons are produced at the same time, so I can look in coincidences and 
And by looking at coincidences, I can really tag the two photons that were produced in the same event and that are properly correlated. Turns out I also know the uh, polarizations of the outgoing photons. That's determined by the geometry of this crystal. It's got a preferred direction in space. And so I can orient that crystal such that the outgoing photons are, are uh, say, vertically polarized. And this notation here is what that says, that this quantum mechanical state produces two photons, each of which is vertically polarized. Now I'm going to complicate it a little bit, and I'm going to take two of these crystals, and I'm going to sandwich them back to back, and I'm going to rotate one with 90, at 90 degrees with respect to the other. And I'm also going to insert a, a, a half wave plate here, and a half wave plate is just a piece of birefringent material that allows me to rotate linear polarization. And so I can rotate the output polarization to any angle that I want by just rotating the wave plate. And so I rotate this polarization to some angle, and what do I know? Well, that at some angle, there's going to be a horizontal component to that polarization. It's going to pump one of these crystals and it's going to produce a vertically polarized photon pair. But that polarization is also going to have a vertical component, and that vertical component pumps the other crystal and makes a horizontally polarized pair. And so what do I have? Well, if I don't actually measure the polarization, right, this is all random. The, I don't know which one of these is going to happen. And quantum mechanics tells us that if you have two possibilities, that you couldn't even in principle distinguish that the quantum mechanical state is then given by a superposition of those two different possibilities. So the quantum state here is this linear combination of either horizontal pair or vertical pair. And the relative amplitudes here, the relative weighting of these, is determined by this input polarization. So by rotating this, I can emphasize either larger fraction of horizontals or verticals, and I can set this to be anything I want. So I can make any arbitrary linear combination of these pairs. And this is an entangled state. So the polarizations of these two photons are entangled with each other. They are correlated in a way that is not allowed by classical physics. This is Einstein's spooky action at a distance. Uh, this is where it comes from, these sorts of entangled states. And so uh, this, is the, this is the source that we use, and now let me kind of map it back onto the uh, analogy that I gave you with uh, Alice and Bob. So what did we say? We said that uh, Alice and Bob were uh, looking at faculty, and the role of the faculty was played by the, uh, is going to be played by the photons here. So uh, this down conversion event that produces the photons, that's the equivalent of the faculty getting up in the morning and coordinating their wardrobes. So the correlations are all established here. And then we assume that the photons go off in, uh, in their two directions, and they don't interact anymore. Alice and Bob then have uh, detectors that are sensitive to individual photons. And they also have a polarizing beam splitter. And what is a polarizing beam splitter? It just splits a beam into its uh, polarization components. So for example, horizontal polarization would be transmitted, and vertical polarization might be reflected uh, at these beam splitters. I said that Alice and Bob had a choice. They could go to 101, or they could go to 999. The role of choice here is, is determined by the, the orientation of these beam splitters. So Alice and Bob can rotate them to, to different directions. Uh, and then there's uh, the measured uh, clothing color that uh, the analogy here is which detector fires, which polarization gets measured. So for example, if Alice has her uh, polarizer set to the 101 angle, we might get uh, called detect, uh, transmitted blue and reflected red. And then uh, at the 999 angle, so maybe they're rotated and, and projecting onto plus and minus 45 degrees, for example, we might call transmitted green and reflected yellow. So that's kind of the analogy. So what do we do in the experiment? Um, we do this a lot to build up good statistics. We detect many photons. Um, 
Alice and Bob can rotate their uh, polarizing beam splitters. They can measure all the probabilities and compare them um, to the predictions. And what do we find? Well, uh, at Whitman, we've been doing this experiment for about a dozen years. Every student that takes quantum mechanics has done this experiment. And every student has seen at least a 10 standard deviation violation of local realism. Okay? Um, that's, a, that's a pretty significant violation, right? Um, in, in sort of research labs, right, they're all, we don't close all the loopholes. Maybe, you know, sort of more experts out here might know about loophole free tests. So people have done these experiments now with Alice and Bob separated by kilometers and randomly choosing and detecting all the photons. And I guess I would say is that while we don't close all the loopholes here, we do see a significant uh, violation of local realism, but the experiments now have been done. There, there's, there's no recourse for local realism. All the loopholes have been closed. Um, the world is not local and realistic. And so just kind of, this is an old picture, uh, but you, you kind of get the idea. You might be able to see there's a little bit of a blue glow here, which is scattering from the blue laser. Uh, the, the down conversion source is over here, and the photons kind of come out like this. We've got Alice's uh, uh, measurement apparatus here, Bob's here, focused into fibers, um, which then take us off to the detectors. And I would say that if you want to implement these experiments, a number, lots of people have. There are lots of institutions that are doing these sorts of experiments now with their students. Uh, if you want to do them in your teaching laboratories, there's a lot of help out, for, out there for you to be able to do this. Uh, so Alpha, the Advanced Labs Physics Association, um, has two things specifically to help you here. One is they sell the detectors for much cheaper than you could buy them uh, commercially. The, the specs are not quite as good as the research grade ones, but they're more than sufficient to do these experiments, and they're less than half the cost. So that Alpha helps you there. And Alpha also has a series of laboratory immersions uh, in which uh, faculty members will spend two to three days at a site uh, immersing themselves in a particular advanced experiment so that they feel comfortable with it going back to their own institution and then setting it up there. And so uh, there are, uh, it, my, I do this, uh, Colgate University does this, Harvey Mudd College does this, number of schools that will offer this immersion, but there are lots of other immersions as well in, in terms of you know, microscopes and NMR and all kinds of things that Alpha makes available. So uh, there's the Alpha website, you should check it out. But if you're still, again, if you're, if you're a little bit hesitant to, um, to do this all yourself, there are a couple of companies now that are, are selling sort of kit versions of this. Um, there's one in Germany called QTools. Uh, Cubitech I'm highlighting here because Cubitech was actually at this meeting. So Cubitech had a booth over in the exhibit hall. I hope you went over there and, and saw their equipment, right? But here's Cubitech's kit that basically does these experiments. And a nice version of theirs is it's all fiber coupled. It all just kind of screws together. It all just kind of works. Um, and so, I don't know, I think it's pretty cool. I like their sources. Um, so, conclusions. Uh, in summary, quantum mechanics, quantum 2.0, I think is, the more I think about it, the more I like to describe it is, it's, it's the same physics. Quantum mechanics hasn't changed, but it, it's a different way of looking at quantum mechanics. And in particular, as the technology has advanced, it has allowed us to do things that we couldn't do before. And by being able to do them, that makes us think more carefully about them. And so there's this wonderful feedback loop of technology allows us to do new experiments, which drives new theoretical predictions, which then drives new experiments and technology. And this loop is going around faster and faster now. And so that's, that's my idea of what it is. And it's really kind of trying to blur this line between physics and engineering. And in some ways, I think that physicists can see that as an opportunity. I think many of us have probably had really talented undergraduate students in our physics classes, and we say, oh, wow, this would make a great physics major. And that student decides that they're going to go into engineering for whatever reason. Maybe they like sort of the more applied side of engineering. 
Now I, you can go to that student and say, guess what? You can get a physics degree and become a quantum engineer, right? Th those uh, things are out there. And I think it can inform how we teach, right? Qubits are interesting. There's a real richness to simple two-state systems uh, that I think we can share with our students. And then furthermore, um, there are laboratories that your students can do that really explore this kind of fundamental stuff. And they're doable, the students enjoy doing them, they learn a lot, um, and I'd like to encourage you to do that. And um, there's my website, there's more information there as well. That's what I got, thanks very much. We do have time for a few questions. I would ask that if you have a question, please come up and use the microphones. This helps us both with our recording of the session as well as people who might not be able to hear despite how good you think your teacher voice might be. Yeah, Mark, thanks for a wonderful talk. That was really uh, interesting. I'm, I'm curious if you think at some point in the future, physics majors will start with quantum mechanics in their programs. Uh, there are, there are some uh, people that are starting to work towards that way. So I know um, Colgate, there are, there's, uh, they bring their first year students into the lab and, and let them see some uh, interactions with sort of these sort of individual photons. Um, there are now also, in addition to just uh, physics majors, there, there are some good books now out there for total non-science majors. That, that talk about these concepts. I actually just this past semester uh, taught, for the first time, taught a, a non-majors quantum mechanics course. Uh, and I was surprised at how sort of eerily parallel the two syllabi were and the sorts of things that I was talking about both in my junior level class and in my non-majors class. And so, you know, clearly you're not gonna go into all the detail, but the opportunity certainly exists to expose students to this. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I enjoyed your talk very much and I just wanted to get some feedback um, as far as uh, physics education research. In last few years, there has been lots of uh, research in the students' learning of quantum mechanics and more recently, there has been this focus of um, teaching quantum mechanics using the spin first or the simple discrete uh, two-state systems, why say continuous basis of uh, quantum mechanic uh, and the wave function of the you mm -hmm. know position. Um, so uh, we, I have uh, been working on this. I've for last six years been using that method and looking at some of the uh, different um, advantages or maybe barriers that the student face in learning in two methods. And as you mentioned, it's not just a couple you know, experiments. You can, in fact, teach uh, the entire postulates and the principles of quantum mechanics in the two-state system, and then hope that the student will transfer and move on to wave function and uh, a larger number of the system and the continuous basis. Right. So one of the challenges that instructors of these courses have been reported, and we have been working on it, is the student's ability to move from discrete and small systems to a continuous and large number of the system. And this seems to be a very big obstacle uh, for many instructors when used this method. And given that you have uh, both uh, experimental experiences and writing the, uh, you know, the book, I wanted to get your insights on whether or not you have observed these in the students learning in moving from these two approaches um, in either direction, in fact, not necessarily first the spin and then wave function, even wave function and moving to spin. Uh, and if you have any comments or suggestion that how one might come about either um, helping the students or putting emphasis in certain aspects of the course or the curriculum material that can help students to pass these barriers. Okay. Um, so the, the, the way that I sort of try to make this transition from sort of uh, discrete systems to continuous systems is, is I, I try to, to use kind of a, a common notation, right, in the sense, so, so to express a, a, a two-state system, right, you have two states, what's the important thing that determines the state is sort of the coefficients, right, that, 
that, that determine the vector, right? And so there's a prescription, right? Given an arbitrary quantum state, how might we determine what those coefficients are? And how do we do that? We do a projection, right? And so what, you, what I simply do is I say, okay, here's how we do it discreetly. We write the projection as a sum, and then you project onto a set of basis states. Now when we're talking about a continuous system, well, what did you do in, in calculus when you wanted to go from a discrete system to a continuous system? Well, we took a limit that the, the, the uh, pieces got smaller and it became continuous and it went over to an integral and you write the projection in, in that sort of way. It's like, oh, look, I'm not gonna write a sum, I'm gonna write an interval, an integral, but I've still got exactly the same projection operator. And then now, instead of having discrete coefficients, I've got the wave function, which is just a continuous thing. So I, I, I just, I try to make the notation look exactly the same and then draw on, on what the students have done before and going from discrete to continuous. So that's how I do it to try to make that as seamless as possible. Yeah, that, that makes lots of sense, but I'm still, you know, we use a very similar material and even using, you know, starting from very limited number of the projection points and the coefficient and then expanding to a larger one. I'm hoping that this new material might help, which is along the same line as you're pointing. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for the work that you've done. I, I think that this really is exciting and shaking things up in an important way. Um, the earlier question about whether people might start um, at different stages with some of these experiments, I, I'll just mention that at Lawrence University, they actually have a, a camp for prospective students where they do these experiments, oh. and it really gets people excited about becoming a physics professor, so they've seen a lot of good out of that. We've also had high school programs in Germany. Right, oh yeah, yeah, in Erlang. So it can be done at different levels, obviously. Um, I will note, as far as the, the alpha immersions, that's two and a half days you come, you get focused training with somebody who's been doing this in their classroom, and the thing that I would add is that we also have equipment grants to help you then get the equipment into your classroom with an 80% success rate. Thank you very much. Uh, I obviously am not a quantum expert, but I work with high school teachers, we're the PTRAs, and uh, the high school students are really, really interested in this and have lots of questions that high school teachers don't know the answer to because most of them have never had much background in this. So we've been working with Perimeter Institute and IQC and so forth in trying to help these teachers. So my question to you, and you may not want to answer it right now, you may want to ponder that. Um, at what level and to what extent do you think this should be introduced at the lower levels, I would say secondary levels, and so do you have like a priority list? I love the way you did it. I was taking notes as fast and furious as I can, but do you see uh, easy correlations that we could help take to those teachers? And I guess the second big barrier we have is whenever um, we ask, you know, what quantum is or how it applies to their lives, the teachers have no clue, much less the kids. So if you have some suggestions on how to overcome those barriers, it's kind of like it's just a big black hole or big black beast that they don't want to touch, but the kids are dying to have information on it. So if you could help us in that, we would appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, I can go to the, anybody ever seen Quantum Entanglement for Babies? Anybody know that book? It, it's pretty cool. Anyway, I, so I'm not suggesting that babies are gonna understand this, but, but it actually, so I read the book to my students um, and, and basically the way that I pose it to it, I actually use it as a learning thing, is like, what got left out, right? You know, clearly this is presented at a, at a really un fundamental level, but what got left out? So, so I guess what I'd say is, you can, I think you can in introduce these in a lot of different places, but the question is at what level you, you wanna go, right? And so if, if you are able to talk just about, you know, algebra and, um, and that kind of idea, Right? I think you can talk about certain aspects of it. Um, and the, the notion, I think the way that I tend to think about this is 
especially if, if, if your students are, are familiar with statistics at all and the notion of correlations, um, to me, like I said, entang entanglement is to me the fundamental thing. And, and it's just a different form of correlations. And so if you can kind of get your students thinking about statistics and correlations, that you can go a long way with, with that. Um, but yeah, also just simple algebra. Um, I, I think it depends, like I said, on, on, on exactly kind of what level you want to get at. And the last thing I would just add is that there are, um, there are also simulations out there. There's some good computer simulations of these sorts of experiments. Um, there's, uh, uh, so the, the spin-up program at uh, Oregon State has got some involving uh, spin one-half particles. Uh, there are some involving photons that are, uh, come out of uh, St. Andrews University, uh, has some good uh, simulations. So those are also tools that are available to you. Let's thank Dr. Uh, Beck again. Thank you very much. All right, at this time I would like to ask our uh, Homer L. Dodge Citation for Distinguished Service awardees to come to the stage, please. I'll introduce the award and then I'll ask that as I uh, talk about individuals, if you would just kind of step forward up into the, into the limelight um, for the camera and smile for the camera. Homer L. Dodge was instrumental in the formation of the American Association of Physics Teachers. His academic home was at the University of Oklahoma where he developed a successful school of engineering physics. Dodge brought this practical academic leadership and experience over a decade of respected physics education work within the American Physical Society to the foundation of AAPT. Dodge became the association's first and longest serving president. Established in 1953 and renamed in recognition of Dodge in 2012, the Homer L. Dodge Citation for Distinguished Service to AAPT is presented to members in recognition of their exceptional contributions to the association at the national, sectional, or local level. AAPT is pleased to present the 2018 Homer L. Dodge Citation for Distinguished Service to AAPT to John Anderson. John Anderson earned his BS and MED at the University of Minnesota and took post-MED courses at Aurora University. He began his teaching career as a high school science teacher in 1986 and has taught at Southwest High School, Minneapolis, Thomas Jefferson High School in Bloomington, Moundsview High School in Arden Hills, and Centennial High School in Circle Pines, Minnesota. As a longtime member of AAPT, John has attended numerous national meetings as both a presenter and a participant. He's currently serving on the Committee on High School Physics, is the new academic coordinator for the Physics Bowl, and was named an AAPT Fellow in spring of 2017. John has also been involved in the PhysTech project since 2007, first serving as a teacher in residence at the University of Minnesota. He became the coordinator of TIRs and visiting master teachers, an AAPT position in the PhysTech project in 2009. In this role, he organized and led training workshops for TIRs, promotes physics, PhysTech to the broader physics community, and supports other TIRs in presenting about their work. His service to the PhysTech project has been invaluable. With his great enthusiasm for the teaching profession, his exceptional talent for mentoring physics educators, and remarkable skill at building professional community, Anderson has made a difference to the national community of physics teacher educators. APT is pleased to present the 2018 Homer L. Dodge Citation for Distinguished Service to APT to Nancy Easterly. <laughs> Nancy earned her BA in Physics with a minor in Mathematics at Ohio Wesleyan University. Her MED is in Curriculum and Instruction with a minor in Oceanography from Texas A&M. She began teaching as a science and math teacher for grades six through eight, and in 1978 took a position as a physics teacher at Cypress Creek High School in Houston, teaching regular physics, honors physics, APC, and serving as a physics team leader. 
In 2004, she started teaching physical science for elementary education majors at the University of Houston downtown and currently teaches elementary physics at Lone Star College, Northwest, uh, North Harris, Greenspoint. For the past several years, she worked with the Georgia Math and Science Partnership Grant at the University of West Georgia, converting the original high school level workshop materials to meet the needs of elementary and middle school teachers attending. She's a highly respected physical science and physics workshop leader and has spent the last 18 years dedicated to improving the teaching and learning of physics. Service to national organizations as well as local ones has also been a focal point of Easterly's career. She has demonstrated distinguished service to AAPT by being a PTRA since 1999 and was the lead PTRA for several years in the Houston area physics teachers organizing many meetings for many teachers. Nancy has also been an e-mentor for AAPT since its inception, helping over two dozen teachers. Congratulations, Nancy. APT is pleased to present the 2018 Homer L. Dodge Citation for Distinguished Service to APT to Mary Ann Hickman Klassen. Mary Ann earned her BA in Astrophysics at Agnes Scott College and her MS in Physics at the University of Wyoming. She started her career at Swarthmore College as lab coordinator in 1995 and is currently senior lecturer at Swarthmore. An active member of AAPT since 1995, Marianne has volunteered in the southeastern Pennsylvania section of AAPT, serving as president from 2010 to 2011. She has organized or presented in introductory labs workshops at summer AAPT meetings since 2007 and served as a reviewer for the physics teacher in 2016. Marianne has served twice as member and chair, including vice chair the second time, once this position was introduced, of the Committee on Laboratories. Labs was named the 2015 Committee of the Year in part due to their development of the AAPT recommendations for the undergraduate physics, physics, undergraduate physics laboratory curriculum, which Marianne has helped to promote through supportive sessions and workshops, both as a presenter and organizer. As an area committee chair, Marianne serves on the programs committee, which puts together the sessions and workshops for the upcoming national meetings. She also currently serves on the meetings committee as an at-large member, helping in the national site selection process. At meetings, she can also uh, often be found in the Pyro Resource Room, volunteering her time and expertise in supporting members who need assistance or are new, looking for new apparatus. Congratulations, Marianne. I'm going in alphabetical order, and our next winner can't be with us today, but I'm going to go ahead and read the citation. AAPT is pleased to present the 2018 Homer L. Dodge Citation for Distinguished Service to AAPT to Daniel Schroeder. Dan earned his BA in Physics at Carleton College and his PhD in Physics at Stanford University. He began teaching at Weber State University in 1993 and continues to teach there. He's probably best known among physicists as the author of An Introduction to Thermal Physics and co-author with Michael Peskin of An Introduction to Quantum Field Theory. Dan has been an active member of the Idaho Utah section of AAPT since 1993, serving as its president in 2003. His service to the American Journal of Physics began in 1998 when he was appointed to the editorial board. He served as book review editor from 03 to 08 and as an associate editor from 2012 to 2016. He now serves as a consulting editor. Dan has given numerous presentations at AAPT meetings over the years, including multiple workshops on creating interactive web simulations using HTML5 and JavaScript. Moreover, Dan has been directly involved in writing undergraduate textbooks and producing a number of educational simulation programs that are freely available to the physics community, including the original SPINS program that he co-wrote with Thomas Moore. Such books and simulation programs have been a benefit to many AAPT members over the years. Congratulations to Dan Schroeder. AAPT is pleased to present the 2018 Homer Dodge Citation for Distinguished Service to AAPT to Steve Spickelmeyer. <laughs> Spickelmeyer earned his BS in Physics at Rose Holman Institute of Technology in Terre Haute, Indiana. His MS and PhD in Physics were earned at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. His teaching career began at the University of Indianapolis, UND, uh, in 1998. 1988, where he was recognized as Outstanding Teacher of the Year in the Division of Science and Mathematics for the 1992-93 academic year. 
From 2011 to 2013, he was a visiting professor at the United States Air Force Academy's Department of Physics before returning to UND in June 2013 as the chair of the Department of Physics and Earth and Space Science. Since joining AAPT in 1990, Steve has been very active in the local Indiana section, serving at times as secretary, vice president, president, and for many years, treasurer. He's currently the Indiana section representative for the national organization, and he previously served on AAPT's committees on laboratories. A nominator noted, Steve has been the treasurer for the section for many years and has been a true steward of the section's finances. Additionally, he continued to support the Indiana section during his sabbatical time at the Air Force Academy from so far away. He co-hosted several meetings of the Indiana section along with Tim Dumont. Congratulations, Steve. Let's once again acknowledge our citation winners. Thank you. Um, we also want to acknowledge um, the 10 AAPT teaching fellows that have been named um, most recently. Um, if you're in the room, would you please stand up for a round of applause after I read all of the names? Tim Dumont, Randall Knight, Joe Kosminski, Lori Reed, Carl Rutledge, Tony Sonsi, Steve Spicklemeyer, Tim Stelzer, Paul Tipler, and Barbara Witten. Please welcome this group into the Teaching Fellows community. All right, our next event is the presidential transfer ceremony, so I'm gonna pass this off to President George Ammon. Thank you, Janelle. It says, as you've seen, Janelle always does an amazing job, and I'm quite frankly in awe of her. As president, all through the presidential chain, I have been extremely fortunate to have been surrounded by people of extreme quality. And this will continue, I am certain, as we transfer the gavel to the new president, Gordon Ramsay. Gordon, would you come up, please? I just want to tell you, although I do not look up to Gordon <laughs> as, uh, <laughs> in reality, um, I certainly look up to him figuratively. He has been an amazing colleague, and I think he's going to be an outstanding president. Gordon, I would like to transfer officially the presidency of AAPT to you, and best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. <laughs> Okay. All right. My first duty as president now will be to close this session. So I thank you all for coming and, and stay tuned for the next session. So it'll immediately follow this session. So thank you.